So the wheel is an important invention uh, made in ancient times out of wood. Uh, it's often said they didn't have the wheel in uh, the Americas or the New World, depending on which inappropriate term you want to use for it. Um, they did have wheels, they just didn't use them much. It was quite interesting. Um, and I think the, the point that you may know about wheels but not use them is actually quite relevant. In the Middle East, uh, people knew about things going around in circles for a long time. Uh, in the Natufian period, these ground stone vessels must have been put on a lathe or something and twirled around uh, to make them go around in order to be ground to such uh, a uniform dimension. Uh, these very round things look very well round um, and wheel-like and are quite like what later are what are called wheels. Uh, turntables would probably be more accurate. Uh, these uh, actually are found um, at Tel Yermuth from the early Bronze Age. And the pot of the archaeologists there got a potter to try them out. It's actually an ancient artifact here, which uh, if you work in the museum, you probably find horrifying. But um, so they, they're quite convinced that this is a turntable and so the idea that a wheel is used to make pottery goes uh, back way before people put wheels on vehicles um, it's whether that's relevant or not I'm not 100% certain so wheels at one time with salt years wheels were actually from Mesopotamia we have some pretty early evidence we have from the mid third millennium BC so that's th two thousands the mid two thousands BC we have this obviously a wheel wheeled vehicle no confusion about that at all um, earlier we have these pictograms interpreted as wagons which actually look a lot like this uh, from the mid fourth millennium BC but also nowadays uh, no no hang on so this is also another type of wheel it's quite interesting actually see this is one type of wheel and this is a, another type of wheel this is on a chariot from the mid third millennium BC um, so now we're actually getting early evidence particularly this is the earliest wheel which I talked to, to you a bit about when we took covering horses the Ljubljana uh, wheel this is a, a later wheel or oh, still quite early mid third millennium BC but it's from the Netherlands which makes you think well these things are really quite widespread aren't they and you see how very similar these wheels are this one's from India this one's from the Netherlands so uh, this goes back to the slide I made for domestication of horses uh, here's the Ljubljana marshes wheel and so around this area there seems to be nowadays a lot of evidence in the mid fourth millennium BC for actual wheels in uh, existence it's not very good evidence uh, archaeological evidence for things which are made of wood can hardly be expected to be very good it includes things like wheels on toys which may of course uh, that's why I happen to start with a a new world or a, from the Americas a wheeled toy and also ruts in roads or something um, which may be evidence for wheels but uh, there does seem to be some relationship between horses and wheels uh, for this part of the world in this early period uh, particularly with uh, the Sintashta culture which is when we first get the first spoked wheels for the chariots which they uh, use to spread around uh, the steps and then the people from around here would then use chariots to invade everywhere else where we then get wheels so this is a Sintashta uh, chariot this is uh, another wheel of that big piece of wood with a hole in it type from Georgia from the second millennium BC and this is an, one of the other type of solid wheel um, but it's actually quite recent this is uh, from Hans Volk's book so it shows you that the solid wheels uh, last for some time although of course spoked wheels became a lot more important in many ways so that brings us to another thing made out of wood and quite popular and also for moving around the boat so 
boats. Uh, so what's this got to do with boats? So this is a world map of why DNA haplogroups and uh, mitochondrial DNA haplogroups are actually create similar pictures of people moving around and gradually going up this way and going that way. And some of these groups you can see seem to be following the coastline. Um, and it's nowadays pretty certain they were on boats. Uh, there's even recent DNA evidence from this part of uh, South America uh, would indicate that the people came from here. Of course, they probably didn't come straight that way. They probably went this way. And with uh, thousands and thousands of years to do it in, why not? Um, people have been in Australia. I think the latest uh, word is 80,000 years now. And you had to get, have a boat to get here. You, you can't like walk it at any time. And so there must have been boats. So boats don't need to be very complicated. This is what you could call a catamaran, or you could call it a bunch of woods tied together for kids to fool around on. Uh, catamaran is actually from Sri Lanka. Catamaran is actually a Tamil word for tying uh, wood together. And so you can have a raft and you can develop the raft a bit. Uh, one thing they did in Mesopotamia was actually put uh, inflated skins under your raft to make it more buoyant. Um, and then you get dugouts and you can link them together, which will lead to outriggers. Uh, here's a nice raft, again from the New World, and here's just like some bits of wood tied together, rather like those boys were on in Sri Lanka. Here's a raft going down the Tigris. Uh, again, this may have underneath it some inflated uh, skins, which will enable it to be carried down the water. Uh, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates are not convenient rivers like the Nile. If you remember at the beginning, I was telling you about how with the Nile, uh, the uh, current will take you in one direction and the wind will blow you in the other direction. The Tigris and Euphrates don't work like that. Uh, they head from the north and go to the south and so does the wind and so you can't actually sail upstream very easily and so the easiest thing is just to make a raft um, and up near the top of the river and put your stuff on it and bring it down gradually you can like pole it a bit if you like or poke it along uh, quite often there are shallows so maybe you can like pole it along and when you get to where you're going, you sell the raft for the wood that it's made of. And then you go back up and make another boat. So, actual boats, shall we say. Um, the world's oldest boat um, is a pine, a pine log boat from the Netherlands, dated to about 7200 BC. And this is it. So you see, it looks quite primitive, but, you know, it is like... 9,200 years old. When 9,200 years old you are, so good you will not look, I can assure you. Um, the word canoe actually comes from the Carib word. Um, the Carib lived in the Caribbean, of course, um, for basically a dugout. And uh, this came via the Spanish word canoa. And that's where we get the word canoe from. A little bit of Canadian content there since we love canoes in this country. Uh, here, in fact, we have some Carib people making a log boat. They're burning the inside. They're using fire a lot, actually. They seem to be burning down the trees, burning off the branches, and uh, burning out the inside. And of course, they would use tools to cut it out as well. Here we have uh, a more recent, but still a traditional log boat construction. And this looks much nicer, but it's still a log boat. Um, and you can do things with the wood, of course. You can heat it up, you can boil it, and you can make it stretch. So at one stage, these uh, nice thin bits may have actually been curling in, and they just curl them out again. Here are some dugouts uh, from the Middle East, from Amman. And so you can see it's uh, still quite simple. You start off with a log, and you keep cutting it until you have a boat left. I actually don't know what these are. They look a bit like um, bundles of reeds. That could be what they are, but it shows a, a battle between uh, the Assyrians and Marsh people. 
This is also a very interesting looking boat from Oman. It's just bits of palm leaf spines bound together. How well it worked, I have actually no idea. Another important uh, type of boat is on called a coracle. Uh, coracles are actually an English version of the Welsh word coracle, uh, which is cognate with the Irish and Scottish Gaelic curragh, which is a very important uh, type of boat in the Atlantic. Um, say in the Bronze Age, they probably used coracles quite a lot, which is basically a boat covered with uh, skin or hide. Um, or textile, probably the former or in earlier times, and then covered with resin. Uh, these seem to be, this one's here, this one's from Vietnam, this one's from, from India. And so you're wondering, well, what about the Middle East? Well, yes, here is one of them. It's basically a basket covered with, in this case, pitch. And of course, in uh, Iraq, where this is, this is in Baghdad, that would be quite abundant and you could make that. So you can see this is a serious mover of people and there's lots of them here you can see all of them so, yeah, so boats like this were the thing you would get the occasional other boat of course but um, up the uh, Tigris and Euphrates this would be a very common way of moving things around it's just basically a big basket and then you cover it um, <coughs> with tar if you remember this impression I showed you a couple of times before with reeds and bulls and priest kings if you look at it, it actually looks like one of these basket boats. This is also one of these boats. You see, this is a Neo Assyrians, and they're sitting on top. They must have a deck on it or something. This is one of these boats. Um, <clears throat> this relates to the Babylonian flood myth of Atrahasis from the 18th century BC. And this is thought to be the prototype for. Um, the great flood epic of, of the Hebrew Bible with Noah. Remember Noah and the flood and the boat, the ark? Uh, well, there was an earlier ark and he was Babylonian, uh, a Noah who was Babylonian, he built an ark and it's thought that he built one of these basket boats, a Kufa. And this chap, Irving Finkel, um, who's a, a curator of the British Museum, made this uh, it's not actually to scale um, but it's still pretty damn big just to see how it worked and, and and he found it worked pretty well it actually let it a lot of water but he built it in India where he couldn't get very good pitch and he felt that if it was made in Iraq where the pitch is very very good um, hence all the oil reserves it would have worked a lot better but uh, no one actually tried that However, there are, is other evidence for early uh, fragments. This is from uh, Al Sabia in Kuwait, where they found these. This is a, like a little boat, which looks a lot like a kufa. And here is a uh, basketry. Uh, well, it's actually not basketry, it's bitumen. So this is pitch, and it's got on one side impressions of baskets, reed, a reed basket. And the other side, it has barnacles which makes you think it must have been a boat. Barnacles on one side. Barnacles are like, if you don't know what a barnacle is, it's a marine uh, animal with a shell and it fixes on rocks in the sea and also on boats a lot. It loves boats. And so if it has barnacles on it, it may have been a boat. And here's some also Ubayid period. This looks a bit like a Kufa and this looks a bit like a, uh, a log boat possibly. And here is possibly another related boat from the Euphrates. Uh, another type of boat we don't actually have much reference to in the Middle East is, of course, uh, the birch bark canoe. Um, you don't often think of birch bark in the Middle East, although you do have birches in parts of the world. And of course, you peel the bark off and you glue it together with resin made from birch bark resin, which you boil up and make it turns into a resin. So, you know, this is a very respectable boat made of the outsides of uh, trees, and so is this. And of course you have reed boats. Uh, reed boats were a big thing in uh, Mesopotamia, and there's also our segue into Egypt. So here we have Egyptians, and remember papyrus, and they're making boats out of papyrus. It seems to have a long tradition. These also look like reed boats, particularly this one. 
Can you imagine making this out of anything other than reeds, just curling up and making it thinner? Probably not. So this is actually pre-dynastic, uh, 5,000 or 6,000 years ago, long time. And this is quite a nice one. This is also from uh, the Nagada period and has this. You see this, it has all these oars. This really big oar is what we call a steer oar, a steering oar. Um, they're typically on the right hand side. And if you've heard of the nautical terms, port and steer starboard, that's because on the left hand side of the boat, you go up against the port and on the right hand side, you have the steerboard on the starboard, you see. So that's where that comes from. Here's some more of these boats from this period. Um, you can see uh, people don't really seem to know what's going on here. They seem to be boats. They seem to have all sorts of interesting things going on. And these little lines, no one really understands. Uh, here are some more of these lines that no one really understands. But people largely think what this is, is a sail. And this is the earliest evidence we have of masts and sails. So for wooden boats with uh, made of boards, there is some evidence that bears were involved. But I think this is kind of uh, dubious myself. Um, boats made of boards, of course, became very popular. Uh, this is the oldest board boat, uh, the Khufu ship at 2500 BC, 43 meters long, and of course is a very respectable boat. 95% um, of it is uh, Lebanese cider, and it has tenons, um, that's the bits that go and join them together here, um, of Sisyphus, remember Sisyphus, uh, also known as Christ's thorn, so that's a very, very nasty plant which makes very dense wood and is very useful. Uh, acacia, of course, uh, you remember acacia is the most common wood type in Egypt, was used for the superstructure. So that's this bit up here. But all this is um, made of cedar. And here you can see a, a boat. And you can see that the, the artist has taken effort to show how they've really just cobbled together bits of wood to put this together because wood is not that common in um, in Egypt and so you have to do the best you can. This is a nice boat where someone did the best they can as well. This is the Sea of Galilee boat. It's dated about 50 BC to AD 50 and was found in the Sea of Galilee and this is a, a reconstruction. It's very popular because of course Sea of Galilee, time of Jesus, uh, people think this could actually be the boat that he did the walk on water from which is statistically unlikely, even if it's like theologically unlikely. Um, so you can see this is also made of cedar. So it's very popular wood. There's also lots of other bits. This, these are bits of oak, the yellow bits. This is a bit of pine tree of Aleppo pine. And so you tend to uh, be expeditious in, in what you're using to make your boats. So plank boats, you have two main types. You have carval construction in which you lay the keel, uh, this is the keel, put the framework on and then fix planks to the framework. This is how most Middle Eastern boats were made, uh, quite often sewn on. Then you have clinker construction, in which you lay the keel and then nail planks to each other, like this. And then you put the uh, framework on the inside. This is actually how, for example, the Vikings made ships. And this is uh, from a Viking exhibition we had, the, the, the ROM, quite recently, in which these nails are all that is left of the ship. And it's sort of like the ghost of a ship. And they, uh, when it was excavated, they plotted the precise location of each nail, so they're able to put it together, and this actually forms the shape of a ship and uh, goes along where these joins in the planks were. Honest. So here you can see they've they put the keel down, they put some planks down, they're putting some more planks down, a lot more planks, and then they put in the interior, and there you have a ship. So, steering oar. Yeah, I told you about the steering oar. Uh, there's a nice steering oar. It's on the left-hand side this time, just to be annoying. 
So, of course, boats became very important, very used by people going around on the sea. Uh, here are some sea peoples using what become the main type of boat for warfare, um, which you have people rowing and a pointy bit. And so the idea is that you go ramming into other ships to put a hole in them and make them sink. In the meantime, you have what you might call marines. People did call them marines. Um, or people do call them marines, um, fighting for the top, shooting at other people, waving things, throwing things, and yet be, being unpleasant. So this is actually a Greek pot. It's actually at the Rom. Could do with a nicer photograph of it. But I actually looked online and there doesn't seem to be one at the moment. And you can see that they are doing the same sort of thing, uh, which is probably quite reasonable. And so this is turned into a Byrene, so you have two levels. This is actually an Assyrian one. Uh, I doubt that the Assyrians were actually that crazy about boats. They probably stole the idea from the Phoenicians. Um, but uh, yeah, 700 BC and you've got two oars. Um, this is a Trireme. Uh, this is um, three banks of oars. And this became the popular warship for many years. And uh, they've worked all sorts of ways out how on earth do you have three banks of boards without them getting in the way of each other and so this is something people have tried no one's actually found one of these things in one piece to actually pick it up and have a look at it but since there's so much money in Greece for, for boats they, they made this boat just to try it out they're very proud of it of course because of the great battles that uh, the Greeks fought in it um, so this is the Eastern Mediterranean, this is actually the Mediterranean and the Middle East in 301 BC. So this is after Alexander the Great and his um, successors were called the Diadochi. And not Diadonkey, Diadochi, Dochi. Anyway, these guys, the successors to Alexander, uh, made immense ships. So we're talking like the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, a bunch of other people in Greece and Anatolia. And then they started, so they made it eights and 16 banks of oars. Ptolemy the fourth made a 40, 40 banks of oars. No one has the faintest idea how it worked. <clears throat> With 4,000 rowers, 400 crew and 3,000 marines. <coughs> Absolutely insane. Later on, we get the Romans fighting the Carthaginians, which I mentioned uh, in the second Punic War. Uh, they had quinqueremes. So this is five banks of ore, much more reasonable. Sounds like the sort of Roman uh, investment. Let's just do five. More than that is kind of silly. Um, and Rome had about 220 in the Second Punic War. Carthage had about 300 and they had a war and uh, the Romans won. <coughs> this is a big battle they had off the coast of Sicily. And you can see these are the rams that were the front of these ships, and with this they would ram into each other and sink each other. And this is obviously one that had sunk, and all that's left of the ship is the big bronze ram. So, in 31 BC, the Romans had pretty much conquered all of this area. There should be a thing that comes, and I'm going to put it all the way there. Yeah, here we go. So here, here's this big circle, okay? So they had Cyrenaica, they had former Carthage, they had Italy, they were into Gaul by then, Greece, most of Asia Minor, Syria. One bit they didn't have was Egypt. <clears throat> so in 31 BC, there was this big battle, the Battle of Actium between Octavian, the future Emperor Augustus, and Marcus Antonius, uh, known as Antony uh, to us, and Cleopatra, of course, the last... Ptolemaic Pharaoh. And so they had this big battle uh, at Actium, a uh, big ship battle. And, uh, and Antony's people had all the big Ptolemaic boats, and uh, Octavian's people had the smaller Roman boats. And uh, they had a battle. And it's highly debatable what happened, but what I like is, the, as usual, the romantic epic story of Cleopatra deciding they weren't going to win and runs away. Um, she actually wasn't on this little barge. She was actually in her fleet. Um, but see, here she is looking very pale <clears throat> and w going off in her boat. And here is uh, Mark Antony looking very plaintive, 
saying, I, where are you going, honey? Anyway, so, and so, so they lost because they went running off and Octavian goes off after her. No, not Octavian. Antony goes off after her and abandons his people and basically loses the entire war, which he may have actually been winning up until that point. <coughs> and so ships like this, with lots of oars and pointy bits, become the main fighting platform as boats up until the 16th century. This is the Battle of Lepanto, 1571. And you can see this is uh, between the Ottomans and the, and, the, and the Christians of the West and Spanish and people like that. And they're having a battle and they're having ships basically exactly the same. However, boats like this start becoming very popular. This is just a cargo ship. Uh, but this leads to a, a bigger ships which go around, sailing around. They get things like this. This is called a rudder, which enables them to steer. So you don't need steer boards, which is quite useful. And this becomes <coughs> eventually massive ships like this. And the thing about massive ships like this, they don't have oars up the side, but eventually they have cannon. And so ships like this will eventually clear the uh, seas of rowing boats with pointy ends. And that's it for boats today. Thank you.